You're listening to another life-transforming message from Awakened Church with campuses in San Diego and Salt Lake City. To find out more about us, go to awakenchurch.com. I feel like I have been preaching the same kind of message in different ways all year. And that's usually what happens with me. I got a bit of a burden on my life to really encourage and esteem the men in our church and our community to rise in their places of influence and become warriors and champions. Um, I've been reading through the book of Judges and a lot of people like doing the Bible in a year, but for me, I like to take my time. (laughs) I I don't want to be rushed. I don't want to just read it to fill a quota, but if you do and that's working for you, you go for it. But for me, I I want to take my time. So I've been reading through the book of Judges and it is mind-boggling how many parallels there are in the world we live in today versus back then. Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun and he was absolutely right. But one of the catch cries in the book of Judges is this, and it kind of sums it up. It says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. So every man did what was right in his own eyes. So as a result of that, there was just major chaos and violence and perversion that was rampant through the earth at that time. If you read the book of Judges, you will see that the book of Judges is why the Bible has an R rating. If, if you thought the Bible was boring, then please turn to Judges and read all about the crazy dysfunction that happened within. I mean, there was like the real housewives had nothing on the people of the Judges era. So, so your homework today is to, is to read through the book of Judges because I think you're going to find yourself in the story somewhere. And the interesting thing about this particular book of the Bible was in the midst of this chaos and calamity and perversion and violence and craziness, God was constantly raising up deliverers. And I believe, true for then, true for now. And we're hearing a narrative out in the world and it it goes a little like this. It's toxic masculinity. So we're trying to teach a generation of young men and young women, that masculinity, male strength is toxic and somehow damaging to our community instead of the male design in order for tyrants to be brought down, for justice to prevail, for heroes and warriors to arise, to bring peace and order to a community. So we are on the the beginning of a new generation, Generation Z, has ended, and now we're in Generation Alpha. Generation Alpha, we're starting again. And I believe it's a prophetic picture of the turning of a page where we are now moving from the days of the past where we've told men that you need to be more like a woman in order to exist in the world, but instead rising up with men of strength who become the courageous heroes of communities and families again. So the title of my message is We Need a Hero. And I got one agenda, and that is to give our men permission to rise in their strength and become godly leaders in our communities and families again. We need you. We can't do it without you. In fact, there's a reason that men were created first. God was doing something by divine design. This is how it looks. I'm going to create man. I'm going to put him in a garden, give him responsibility over it to tend it and keep it. And then I'm going to bring a whole lot of animals and I'm and they're going to be the test run. And then once he's figured out how to treat the dog and the cat, I'll then bring to him my, my most prized, precious finale of creation, my daughter Eve. Because <laughs> if he can look well after the animals, we can start there and I'll bring up my girl that I love so much. So I want to talk today um, about the qualities of a hero and what they look like. I'm going to be speaking from the book of Gideon. When you look at how God found Gideon, it was a pretty pathetic picture, really, on the external. So Israel was being attacked by four different enemies from every side. And the Bible says that the Amalekites and the Amorites and the two groups of people from the east, the east campus, were coming in... (laughs) 
and they were ravaging Israel. They were taking their crops. They were stealing their women. They literally left no sustenance left for the children of God. They were living far beneath what they were called to as God's kids. But then God, because he, his ear is always inclined to the cry of his people, comes down or the angel of the Lord comes down and finds Gideon. This very cowardly looking man who was threshing wheat in a wine press because he was afraid of the Midianites. And he comes and he finds him and he says, Gideon, you mighty man of valour. I mean, talk about, many of us would say, wow, you missed that one, God. (laughs) Totally misread that situation. But what I love about God is he doesn't get confounded by the external. He speaks to the potential on the inside and says, I know who you truly are and who you truly can be. And that's, that's maybe a key for some of the women folk here today. We can take a second to break that down a little bit. If you want to get the best out of your husband, as much as we've tried throughout the ages to make it happen through nagging, it doesn't work. Encouragement is the greatest uplifter, is the greatest motivator for a man. I had um, someone meet with me many, many years ago in a land far, far, far away um, about an issue she was facing with her husband. And my husband won't lead and my husband won't pray and I have to encourage him to go to church. And, have, and, and I'm smart enough now after very, very many years of ministry to read between the lines. I have to constantly pray for the wisdom of Solomon because I think what she was wanting me to say was, wow, your life's tough. Why don't you just divorce him? Why don't you just try getting married to somebody else? But see, I'm, I'm smarter now. I'm not buying what a lot of you guys are trying to sell me. And I said, all right. I said, all right. Tell me what the conversations look like in your, in your home. Do you encourage him? Because if you want a courageous man, you've got to be an encouraging woman. See, many of us, we want, we want the, the man of our dreams, the Pinterest board, face of a Ryan Gosling, body of a Dwayne the Rock Johnson, uh, heart of King David and the courage of a Joshua. Oh, but I don't want to put courage in. Here, here's the list of all the things you need to change. Okay, so, so I said, tell us what your, what your conversations are like. And she said, well, I tell him, you know, I want a man who knows how to pray and I want this and I want that and I need you to be more this and I need you to be more that. And I said, okay, ta 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 <laughs> Okay, for the next two weeks, you're not allowed to tell him anything he needs to change. Oh, she looked at me like I just told her that she had three minutes to live. <laughs> and then I said, and not only that, so you, you're not allowed to tell him anything he needs to change for two weeks. And for two weeks, you need to have sex with him every night. <laughs> At that point, she just went pale, like the blood drained out of her face. I said, I can guarantee you at the end of two weeks, that man is going to be chasing you to church. <laughs> chasing you, chasing you down, following you to church. So maybe I'll put that out as a little, you know, put, lay, lay that gauntlet down for the women. Because here's what Peter says. He says, those of you who have an unbelieving husband, and unbelieving husbands come in various shapes and sizes. Some of them may be even in church and actually know the Lord as their personal saviour, but are a little bit discouraged. And Peter says to them, he doesn't say, just pray in tongues a whole lot and give him a list of all the things he needs to change. He said that your husband will be saved through the conduct of their wife. Not the nagging. The conduct. You know the amazing thing? This wasn't in my message in the last two services, just this one. Somebody here needs to hear that. There's some conduct that will bring a revolution into the state of the men in our world. If we want our men to be heroes, then we have to be cheerleaders. I'm going to speak to the women for a second. I remember uh, Jürgen and I were going through a bit of a drought in our marriage. And I was a bit exasperated going, oh my gosh, what is it you want? You're so needy. (laughs) <laughs> when the truth was I was the needy one but he just got really vulnerable for a second and he said I want a cheerleader and I said it's the short skirts isn't it <laughs> yeah. and he goes yes and 
a cheerleader cheers for her man or her team even when he's losing. When he's losing, she doesn't change sides. He can look to the sidelines and always see her there with the pom-poms and the short skirt. So So that's a little, that's something that the other services didn't get. That's for you there. Because this is really, I'm, I'm wanting, and that's helping the men, that's helping the ladies. So I'm laying the gauntlet down. I know a lot of you are sweating right now. Oh my gosh, I wish my husband wasn't here to hear that. <laughs> you mean I have to have sex with him every night for two weeks? Yes, you do. <laughs> and men, you can make checks payable to Leanne Matessi. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. That is for free. I love you. I want to help you. So we're going to look at the hero that Gideon became and, and, and what that meant, because we can have a pretty convoluted idea of what it actually means to be heroic. And heroes don't have a, a size or shape or type. So I'm not saying today that we need to make our men more, more, more like the man on the brawny paper towel packet. <laughs> Listen... Men, heroes, come in different shapes and sizes. You might be more sensitive and artistic. We don't want to turn you into Charles Fuller, have you whittling things out of wood, okay, if that's not your way of doing things. But what I will say to you today is every man, we need every man, listen to me, I'm speaking prophetically, to rise up in their strength and become the leaders of their communities and their families and their churches again. Masculinity is not toxic. True masculinity, when it is developed rightly and submitted unto God, brings about justice, brings about liberation, brings down tyrants. I'm telling you, we need our man to rise. There has been a war on men and it is as old as time. If we look in the book of Exodus, we see that there was a decree went out that was a satanic decree that all the men, the male babies, would be put to death. Sounds like a war on men to me. And we can pipe off all of day long about the war on women. But can I put it to you that the war on women is a result of the war on men? We have suffered as women because the enemy has been relentless at going after our boys. And we say, enough! Yes, I felt that. Good. Then even in the New Testament, if you say that's an Old Testament thing, well, you're wrong. Because in the book of Matthew, we see that Herod sent out a decree decree to to put to death all the male children. Sounds like a war on men. Is it any surprise that in the book of Ezekiel, God prophesied, so I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap on behalf of the city. And yet I found no one. Could it be that we've been asleep at the wheel in raising strong men that know how, who have permission to lead. Because yeah. we're, we're in a culture right now that wants to, to elevate women while squashing down men. Now, the, the, the idea is not to then push women down and let men rise. No, it's that men and women are able to rise together and understand that we truly are better together. There's a reason God created male and female because male and female working in uni together makes every community tick. The first thing we want to look at is that heroes protect their families from the enemy. Let me break that down even more for you. Enemies, both foreign and domestic. So not just the enemy on the outside, but the enemy on the inside. So let's talk about the enemy on the outside. So Gideon had to come against the princes of Midian. The princes of Midian were Oreb and Zeb. Oreb meaning crow, Zeb meaning wolf. There are two enemies that every human will fight. Now, you might think, well, if I just live my life straight and I don't make any waves and I pretend the devil doesn't exist, he won't attack me. Wrong. Wrong. He's a thief. Doesn't care who he steals from. Uh He's a thief. And that's why the Bible says, I want you to be aware of his schemes. So, men, you have to be well armed spiritually. And we have a generation of women who have risen in their strength spiritually, but a generation of men who, for whatever reason, have kind of push the spiritual heavy lifting onto their wife. She's the one out praying. She's the one warfaring and taking communion. And it's a beautiful thing and we don't want her to stop. But we need our men to arise as leaders spiritually in their families to stand in the gap. 
Peter says this. He says, wives, I want you to dwell with your, uh, excuse me, husbands, I want you to dwell with your wives with understanding. Understanding that she is actually the weaker vessel. Now, it's the Bible's words, not, not mine. But it's the truth. It doesn't say cheaper vessel. It says the weaker vessel, which means men and women were created to carry different things, different burdens. Some would say that the weaker vessel could actually be called the more expensive vessel. <laughs> and I mean that in a very pandering way to all my sister friends. But, but when you put the lion's share of responsibility on your wife, man, for her to carry your family spiritually, she's going to start to crack. And then you'll say things like, my wife's a crackpot. Yeah. yeah, my wife, she's a flipping crackpot. She's a psycho. Okay, well, then you need to ask yourself, what have I been putting on her that I was meant to carry? It's one thing to pipe off about your wife, a completely other thing to say, man, what pressure is she carrying that she was not built to carry that I have to now pick up? And I shared this before, but it's worth sharing again. When, men have to, uh, when women have to carry what is not theirs to carry, they, their testosterone spikes in the natural. It's, it's a scientific response or a natural response to what she's having to carry in, in the spirit. And when that happens, she becomes mean and hairy. <laughs> and so there's no point saying, I wish my wife wasn't so mean and hairy. Instead, say, what is it that I've put on her that she actually wasn't equipped to carry? Where do I need to stand and protect my family from the enemy, both foreign and domestic? So when the enemy comes against your family, when the crow and the wolf, the crow, Oreb, the wolf, Zeb, the one who wants to steal the produce, the wolf who wants to kill the sheep, who wants to take the person, you need to stand up and know the weapons of your warfare. And it's not these guns that are going to bring down the enemy. It's your spiritual guns. It's an understanding, man, of what is your weaponry in the spirit. And the Bible talks about it very clearly in Ephesians 6. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. And it tells us what they are. It says that you're going to overcome the enemy when you put on that belt of truth, something you cannot take off. The minute you take off that belt of truth, you, your pants fall down and it's humiliating for everybody. <laughs> That blessed breastplate of righteousness, that helmet of salvation that will guard your thoughts according to the fact that I'm a believer, I am washed in the blood. The, the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You have a purpose. People that don't fight with the purpose of the kingdom end up engaging in fights that don't matter. Uh, and then you have the, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. You fight with the Word of the Lord. And then you hold up that shield of faith, the Bible says, for which you can quench all the fiery darts of the enemy, which is really good news because it tells us that all the darts of the enemy can be quenched. But let's talk about the domestic enemies, the terrorists within. So I'm grateful for a husband who has made himself teachable who has humbled himself because he's realised that our family not only needs to be protected from the enemies without, but also the enemies within. Yeah. And one of the greatest griefs for me as a women's minister, as a pastor to women, is hearing their stories over their frustration of the blind spots or the pride that their husband carries and the things that they won't see. So when Mike Connell, our dear friend and pastor, comes to town, in a lot of ways he's mine and Jürgen's pastor, we give him permission to speak into any areas or blind spots in our lives. My husband is the first person to make a meeting with him, to say to him, whatever you see, I want to hear it and I want to change. And it's beautiful. And uh, there was a story and my husband's told it, so I feel like I have permission to tell it. Where we'd get in the car and, and he would just, it's like he would become a different person, like road rage. And we'd be driving along and it was like every driver on the road was a demonic obstacle <laughs> to him getting to his destination. And he'd drive up beside people if they were driving slow and he'd give them the death stare. <laughs> he'd get close enough to go to the same speed to just stare at them. <laughs> shake his head in disgust and then speed off at the warp speed with a C3 church sticker on the back of his car. 
That's why we had to change our name to Awaken. <laughs> Too many. That C3 church, I saw that pastor. Oh, oh, what? No, yeah, no, that, yeah, I go to Awaken. Those C3 people, terrible drivers. But I was able to say to him, and he heard it, and it's hard for men to hear stuff, and that's why we need you to be teachable and fight the domestic terrorists within. I said, baby, maybe your road rage is just actual rage that you take on the road. <laughs> and he's like, all right, well, not sure if there's anything in it, but I'm going to submit it to Mike Connell. An hour and a half deliverance session later... <laughs> I have a new husband. <laughs> we need you to protect us from enemies, both foreign and domestic. And now for the ladies. Yeah. I thank God I don't have a passive man who lets me uh, have conversations with the enemy that don't lead our family anywhere positive. And that scenario is as old as time. Yeah. When I think about Eve, Genesis chapter 3, I mean, the, the world had just started. It's all right. We've already wrecked it. Uh, and the Bible says that uh, Eve was having a conversation with the serpent, the devil. I mean, to start with, can you imagine if Adam was Charles Fuller? Before that serpent had a chance to utter a word, he would have been boots and a belt. <laughs> with an Emerge Ranch branding on the side. <laughs> But not only, and see, we think, we think Eve was alone when she was having a conversation with the devil. No, the Bible is very clear. And her husband was with her. He's watching this little scenario happen. And quite often I wonder if it was because his wife was naked. <laughs> if I say she shouldn't talk to the serpent, will I still get to see her naked? <laughs> There's a risk attached to that. And so before long, because she'd had this dialogue with the devil that the husband had not intervened in, she's now reaching for a piece of forbidden fruit. Wow. She takes a bite and she hands it to her husband who was with her yeah. and he ate it. I thank God that I have a husband who is not afraid to slap that apple out of my hand. Yeah. And we need to hashtag that. Amen. Slap that apple, America. Slap that apple. <laughs> Because there are, there are moments when I need the man in my world to say, stop talking to the devil and stop eating his flipping fruit. So lean in. Does your wife have apple on her breath? Because there have been times when I have, and I've thank God that I'm not married to a beta male, but an alpha who in spite of the fact that he may have spent a night on the couch, told me not what I wanted to hear, but what I needed to hear. Let me tell you about such time so you feel better about yourselves. <laughs> so we were going out for dinner one night and I had, I had the best plans of us going to somewhere with ambience. Somewhere where you didn't get a menu that was laminated and you didn't have to wear a bib to partake in the food that was served. <laughs> And so we're driving past, and, and that usually is all the time, by the way. Don't feel sorry for me, okay? Um, and we're driving past, and my husband sees a sign, Rock Bottom Brewery. And some of you have heard this, but it bears repeating. And my husband's like, oh, Rock Bottom Brewery? I've always wanted to go to the Rock Bottom Brewery. I'm like, babe, you didn't even know it existed till like one second ago. And he goes, I know, but I I've always wanted to go there. So he diverts the car and he parks the car and he's just pumped out of his brain. We're going to a Rock Bottom Brewery. And he's walking into Rock Bottom Brewery. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made. Ha, 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 ha. And I'm all the while like bitter and twisted because we didn't get to go where I wanted to go. And I'm walking in after him. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrow. And as I walk in, like oh, this whole time I'm rehearsing all the things I don't like about him and all the bad things he's done to me over 23 years of marriage. We're sitting at the table. He's living his best life. A platter of wings, a schooner of beer. And he looks over at my face and I look like I've been baptised in vinegar and lost my last friend. And he's like, babe, what's wrong? 
I'm like, well, I was just thinking <laughs> about something you did to me 22 years ago <laughs> when I just had our first baby, Jordan, and I was only 19. And <sighs> the labour was long and it was hard. I had to have two epidurals to cope. And then afterwards I asked you, I asked you why would God allow me to have such a long, hard labour? And you said to me, it was probably because there was sin in my life. Oh. <laughs> I, 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 eat the apple. I, 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 I. Yeah, you have some too. I, I, I. Right? But my husband, thank God, he could smell the apple on my breath. He could hear the rattle of the serpent's tail. <laughs> And he looks over at me. And look, he could have just been like, oh, you're right, I suck. Let's go to Ruth's Chris. But he just stretched out his hand and he said, Leanne Matesius, you stop it. You are not a victim. And I'm like... <laughs> he said, you're not allowed to stink up present, fun, joyful moments with 22-year-old offences that you've dug up out of the ground and you use it to stink up today, you are not a victim. He got that apple and he slapped it out of my hand. We are looking for men, heroes, who not only fight the devil on the outside, but the devil within. I'm gonna, I'm gonna address, men, if you can say, I'm gonna address my issues, my road rage that is just actual rage, and that victim spirit on my wife. My gosh, our communities would shift. Too many men scared of their wives. And, and I'm not saying that you all of a sudden need to become this mean monster. No, 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 no. Strength in a marriage relationship when wielded by a man is gentle. Yeah. It's honourable, but it's firm. Yeah. Honey, you're not going to eat that and I'm not going to eat it either. We are not going to eat from a tree that is only going to bring death and destruction to our family. We need that kind of man to stand again in our communities. Come on, America, come on. Heroes protect their families from the enemy. Heroes don't allow perversion to have a place in their homes. After God spoke to Gideon and ignited the call on him to be a leader, a warrior, a hero, a masculine man. That's what masculinity means. It's not your guns and your buffness and your own hashtags of you at the gym. It's, it's you rising up and becoming this kind of person yeah. where you take down the perversion in your household. So there were some idols set up in the town in his father's house. And God came to Gideon. Go ahead and throw that up there. That's Gideon, I believe, Judges 6, 25 to 26 where God comes to Gideon on the same night, the same night he has the God encounter. Today, you're going to have a God encounter about, about what true male strength looks like. And you're going to go home immediately. And you're going to tear down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the wooden image, which was a pornographic image that is beside it. Don't wait. Right now, you're going to be in a beautiful moment of a God encounter, go home and toss out everything in your home that is not befitting of the family that God has called you to raise and lead. So Gideon, he did this. He would not allow perversion to live in his community and his home anymore. Sometimes we need a man who will say, not in my house, not in my house. And it's not legalism. It's not religion. It's liberty. It's freedom. It's leadership. If you truly understand that the wages of sin are death, you will do whatever it takes to lead your family in a pathway of righteousness. I am so grateful for my dad. My dad is a beautiful Christian man. And he didn't have, he didn't have a role model like Gideon to kind of base his life off. His dad was not present. He suffered a lot of internal enemies that he had to bring down. But the dad, the only dad I know and remember is a dad who was gentle and strong and virtuous. And there were things that were not allowed in our home. There was one, one particular day when, when, cause my dad had said to my sisters and I, you can't bring any videos home from Blockbuster. That's right. Videos yes. that are, have an M rating, PG only, PG and below. 
And so he was out. So we thought, well, we're going to sneak because there's a movie called Coming to America. And I'm going to, we're going to, because Eddie Murphy, he's funny. And so we, we got the, the, the video from Blockbuster and we brought it home under cover of night, right? My dad was out, so we put it in, we start watching it. Anyway, my dad sneakily came home without letting us know. And he walked into the room just as that moment as Eddie Murphy was spitting out a tirade of F-bombs. And he, he kind of didn't know as he walked in what was happening. But as he's walking, F-bomb, F-you, no F-you. It was like every F-bomb was like a shot in the heart. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, walk, walking through the TV room. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. And he just spun around on his heel and said, what trash are you girls watching? And we're like quivering. Ah, oh, sorry, Dad, we didn't know it was M. Lie. And he said, get that filth back to Blockbuster and go get a movie you know is permitted and allowed in this household. So we went and we hired Karate Kid for the 20th time. <laughs> in my childhood, I felt a little restricted. But I thank God, as a 45-year-old woman today, that I do not have a head full of images that I need to unsee that I was given a role model. So when I came to choose a man for myself, I could choose a man who honoured and cherished me and protected me like my father had. You know, I, I think even if you haven't lived life this way, it's no, not too late to start. Gideon wasn't a young person. He already had a wife and a family when God came to him. And they'd been living in a culture of perversion. But God said, just because that's how it started doesn't mean that, that how it ha- that's how it has to end. This, this very day, you can bring a shift. And I would say this very day, we need men to shift and do what's right, to not allow perversion to have a place in their homes. In the story of King Asa in 2 Kings, we see that King Asa came into power and immediately when he had his own kingdom to influence, the Bible says that he got rid of every idol of perversion. He even excommunicated his own grandmother, Makar, from the kingdom because she had a pornographic idol. That takes throw mama from the train to a whole nother level. But my friends, do what needs to be done in order to raise your family, your sons, your daughters and your wife well. Somebody say amen. Amen, Amen, Leanne. I'm going to amen myself and I will drink to that. And I will say this too, that Gideon was, they changed his name from Gideon to uh, uh, Jerubbabel, I believe. Let me just see. Yes, Jerubbabel, Jerubbabel, which basically means let Baal contend for himself. He became a superhero because of the devils he brought down. Men, we want you all to have superhero status. Things can shift. You are the key that unlocks the door of righteousness here. And us girls are going to be willingly follow, following you through. But, but understand today, there is a war on men. And if we aren't able to properly stand in the gap against the enemy who wants to take our men down, the collateral damage will be seen in not only our women, but our children as well. It's time. It's time. It's time for for men to rise in their strength. Amen. Amen. Go on, give God a shout. I know it's a lot. I'm trying not to be intense. Point number three. Heroes, and I'll ask the band to come as we close, teach their sons how to fight. See, right now, we're living in the aftermath or the harvest of a generation of young men who have been overmothered and underfathered. So, and look, that's, you, you can, Blind Freddy could see that. I mean, all you have to do is look around to see that we're seeing men and women in major confusion over their identities. And that's not something that we need to be mocking and laughing at, but it's a sign of the times. Something's amiss here. Something's a problem. So we're in a a time in our society and culture where almost 50% of men and children are being raised in a home without a present daddy. That's a problem. That's going to have a problem on the world. That's going to, you know, they're, they're now susceptible to all the societal ills. And the issue, we see, we want to treat the symptoms. But God's saying, I want you to deal with the root. When you raise strong men, when you teach men how to fight the enemies that are trying to bring them down, you'll see that all of society will shift. 
And that's exactly happened. what happened after Gideon engaged with these particular devils and brought them down and taught his son how to fight. That 40 years of peace, 40 years, imagine that. In Judges 8, 20 to 21, it says, And Gideon said to Jetha, his firstborn, Rise, kill them. So they'd caught these two enemies, these kings of Midian. But the youth would not draw his sword because he was afraid. And that's a beautiful statement. Like it's a sobering statement that deserves our compassion. Can I say today that our young boys, when they look like they're sitting on the couch and they've got nothing going through their head, they've got everything going through their head. How am I going to be the leader of a family? How am I going to say no to the temptations that when, when my flesh is calling me this way, but I know God's calling me that way, what do I do? I'm afraid. And a young boy left alone with no teacher, with no father to help him bring down those enemies that are trying to bring him out will be completely demolished by the enemy and collateral damage of a fatherless, male strengthness, lessness, society. So it says that Zeba and Zulmana, they were the kings of, of uh, Midian, excuse me. He said, rise yourself and kill us. For as a man is, so is his strength. So Gideon arose and killed Zeba and Zulmani and took the crescent ornaments that were on their camels' necks. Our young men need to know how to fight the two kings of Midian. Zeba and Zulmani. Zeba, mean, Zeba means victim. And do we not have a spate of young men who have been trained in the ways of you can have pleasure without responsibility? Yep. So you can, you can be a player. You can sow your seed all over San Diego and have a whole bunch of baby mamas because you're not going to take care of them. Society is going to... And then we put the burden on the mother. So we have single parent homes. We have babies born and raised in families without fathers because we haven't taught them how to bring down that victim spirit that has them do what they please and then run away from responsibility and leave destruction and despair in their wake. It's time, men. It's time for the men to stand. Teach those men how to take down that victim spirit. No more, no more. I'm going to be responsible for that which God has given me. I'm not going to have sex with a woman until it's the woman I want to marry because I am prepared to properly steward and father every life that comes from my loins. Imagine how different our world would look. Imagine how much emptier our jails would be. Imagine how many young men would not be lost in a battle of confusion about who they are because they never knew their daddy. Things can be different. And Zulmani, the apparition, the idol, that, that image that looks so pleasurable. Oh my gosh, if you have me, oh, I offer so much. Lie, a shadow, an apparition, the pornography epidemic. The, the drug epidemic where escaping out of reality wow. and not living in the real wo- world looks so enticing, but it's a snare. It's a snare. Teach them. Oh, but porn's so big. Drugs are so big. They're not bigger than God. They're not bigger than God. And when God, the angel of the Lord, found Gideon, he said this, and this is key to it all. I will be with you. You can do anything when you know that God is with you. And it was less about Gideon's strength and more about the God of Gideon's strength. But we need men. We don't wanna do it without you. We can't do it without you. We are better together. But now we're entering the season where men will arise and there is a harvest on the other side. Those gold ornaments, crescent ornaments that were around their camel's necks that were the spoils of war, they represent a new beginning. Generation Alpha, even The world is prophesying what God is saying. We are gonna start again. A new beginning is possible. We can put a period on Gen Z and the pain and the anxiety and the depression and the porn addiction and the drug addiction, and we're gonna start again. But it means we're gonna have to ignite the Gideons in our midst, the mighty men of valour. I'd love it if every man would stand. I wanna pray for you today. And I I wanna start by saying this that I apologise on behalf of womankind who have not called you into the champions and the valiant man that you are. 
It's who you are. I mean, we don't want a future that is female. Terrible. I can't think of a worse future than a future that is purely female, other than a future that was just purely male. That would be maybe just a tad worse. But we need you. So I apologise. We need men of strength. I want to tell you a secret that every woman deep down in her heart, even if she doesn't admit it, knows. We don't want passive men who don't stand and lead. We want men who protect, who provide, who are honourable, who cherish, who throw their coat on the puddle, even though we could walk around it. The gesture means a whole lot to us. We need you. And no amount of feminist theory can change that. Male strength is not a social construct. It's who you are divinely. You're a strong man. You're a valiant man. We call out the warrior and the hero on the inside of you, and we will be your cheerleaders. Lift your hands to the Lord. Father, I thank you for our men, our men. We honour them, we esteem them, and we cherish them today. We put courage in them. We say to you today, be strong and courageous. Be strong and very courageous for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I declare the greatest leaders of this next generation stand in this room. Men who will stand in the gap, who will fight enemies, both foreign and domestic. Men who would bring down the idol of perversion starting in their own household. And men who are committed to teaching this next generation of husbands and fathers and men to fight. Teach them how to fight. Put a sword in their hand. And even I will say to you prophetically today, do not limit your fathering to your own biological children. 50% of our boys have no strong male role models, have no father in their home. It's time for you to stand in the gap and be a father to the fatherless. If each of you found one young man one boy who doesn't have a daddy and said, I'm going to teach you how to fight. I'm going to teach you how to bring the enemy down. I'm going to teach you how to live with true masculine strength. I'm telling you, this city will look so beautiful and God will say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Father, I thank you for our men. We bless them and esteem them today in Jesus' name. And everybody shout it. Amen, amen, amen. Receive it today. This word, like every prophecy, grab your seats, is just an opportunity. A prophecy is an opportunity. You can decide to grab it and take it and disregard it because you don't want to listen to a woman or just because you don't want to listen to anyone. Or you can go, that was the word of the Lord for me. Father, I thank you that you have anointed and enabled me to be a Gideon in my generation. But men, we love you. We believe in you. And we're going to champion you every step of the way. And as we come to a close, I'd love it if every head was bowed and I was closed. If you're here and you've never asked the Lord into your life, well, this is, this is the activating factor. This is where it all starts. See, it was the very beginning that the angel of the Lord said to Gideon, God is with you. And I want to ask you this question. Have you acknowledged today that God is with you? Have you surrendered your life? Have you given your life to Him? Because none of what I've spoken about can be achieved unless you do that first. Jesus is here. God loves you. And the whole premise of, of church is for us to disciple you and to let you know that there is a God in heaven who loves you with an everlasting love. And the beautiful thing is, is that He loves us as He finds us. When, when God found Gideon, Gideon looked like a coward. He was in a wine press. And he actually wasn't turned off by Gideon's weakness. He saw the strength of the man within. He called out the potential within. Right now, we're going to sing a song, and I believe it's the anthem of this generation, because God does love you as He finds you. But He never leave us, leaves us where He finds us. He always has a plan and a, person, a purpose. There is a God assignment on your life. So today as the band comes forward and starts to sing this, you love me as you find me. I want you to come forward. If that's you, just saying, God, God, I position myself to be found by you today. And I want to declare before you, before heaven and earth, God, that you are my God and you're with me. Thanks for listening. To find out more about our locations, team, and what we do here at Awakened Church, go to awakenedchurch.com.